hasn't dreamed of living forever. For most of human history, death has been one of the few inevitabilities in our lives. However, that hasn't stopped us from dreaming of immortality. Over the last few centuries, incredible strides have been made in medical science, which have extended life far beyond what our ancestors thought possible. Who is to say that we can't take it even further in the future? Hi, my name is Eric, and this is Time Skipper. Today, we're going to break down the 60-year history of cryonics, the purpose of which is a potential indefinite life. The 1960s. In the 1950s, scientists started speculating about the potential for cryonics, but it wasn't until the 60s that the first steps were taken. In 1962, a mathematician named Robert Ettinger published a paper called The Prospect of Immortality, which was the first true scientific proposal for freezing human bodies. As he advocated for this process, the term cryonics developed gradually throughout the decade. The seeds were planted. They just needed to be watered. 1966 saw the first actual cryonic freezing of a human body. The subject was an unknown middle-aged woman who was frozen in liquid nitrogen after being embalmed. You might be thinking that draining someone's blood and replacing it with preservatives might make it a little harder to revive them. And you'd be right. Let's take it easy on the early cryonic scientists, though. It was their first time. In actuality, it was not a successful cryopreservation. Within a year, she was thawed and buried by her relatives. You can read more about suspension failures such as this on our website. They wised up, however, the following year when Dr. James Bedford was frozen within hours of death. Because he wasn't previously embalmed, many consider him to be the first person frozen and the first successful cryopreservation. He's actually still frozen today. The 1970s and the 1980s. Cryonics truly took root in the 1970s. The Alcor Foundation, still among the largest cryonics organizations on Earth, was founded in Arizona in 1972. Robert Ettinger founded the Cryonics Institute in Michigan just a few years later. Over half of all frozen patients today are still found in these labs. A few other cryonics companies came and went during this era, usually folding due to financial burdens for a speculative process. In an industry like cryonics, longevity is pretty important. In the late 70s, neuropreservation became a viable option. This process involves freezing the head alone, making it more financially viable than freezing the entire body. Still to this day, this process is a topic of discussion in the cryonics community. The Cryonics Institute doesn't even offer the option. The 1990s and 2000s. Over the following decades, cryonic technology developed immensely. Arguably the most important progression was the use of vitrification, a method of cooling which almost entirely eliminates crystal formation in frozen bodies. Now before this, crystal damage was one of the leading causes of degradation of frozen bodies, and the process is still used today. In the mid-2000s, cryonic scientists reached a crucial milestone. For the first time, a mammalian organ, in this case a rabbit's kidney, was frozen, then revived to a functional state. This was a huge morale boost for cryonics advocates and did a world of good in spreading the word worldwide. It was only a matter of time before new companies emerged on a global scale. In 2005, cryonics officially went international when CryoRest was founded in Russia, the first cryonics service provider outside North America. The 2010s. International interest in cryonics continued to spread in the years that followed. China joined the movement in 2010 with the founding of their own cryonics lab called Yingfeng, and Europe followed suit with Tomorrow Biostasis in Berlin. These two companies are up-and-comers, but they indicate cryonics' growing influence and popularity. 60 years after Robert Ettinger's landmark paper, the popularity and technology surrounding cryonics have made incredible progress. We may not have reached the crucial point of reviving a human body, but there is more reason to be optimistic than ever. Yes, cryonics still has its naysayers and skeptics, but the question we here at Time Skipper like to ask ourselves is this, why not try? After all, if you don't choose cryonics, you are choosing a certain oblivion over an uncertain one. So, what do you have to lose? Thank you for tuning in to Time Skipper. We have a few questions for you to think about. When do you think cryonics will become a reality? When do you think we'll hear the news about the first person to wake up after cryosleep? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed this little history lesson and would like to stay updated, please click on the links below to like and subscribe. Once again, this is Eric from Time Skipper. We'll see you next time.